I am George Robert Yost from Cairo, Illinois. I joined the crew of the ironclad USS Cairo on January the 25th, 1862, when I was 14 years old as a first class boy. I joined a diverse crew of sailors. They were boys and men, dark skinned and light, not only from our country, but from 10 foreign countries. Our commander was Lieutenant Nathaniel C. Bryant. Our ironclad was constructed close by at the Mound City Shipyard by James Eads. On January the 15th, 1862, it became part of the Union Army's Western Gunboat Fleet under Flag Officer Andrew Hall Foote. After being assigned to the ironclad, we make some trial runs to get familiar with it. I decide to keep a diary of our daily activities. Soon we receive orders to sail to Clarksville, Tennessee and secure an important railroad bridge there. We sail up the Ohio, Tennessee and Cumberland rivers, finally approaching Forts Defiance and Clark on February the 17th. Fort Defiance sits on a strategic 200 foot bluff across the Red River from Clarksville and we expect a battle, but Lieutenant Bryant spots a white flag flying over the Confederate fort and no guns are fired. When we arrive in Clarksville, there are no rebels to contend with, as they have left before our arrival. However, before leaving, they attempted to burn the railroad bridge that we came to secure, but the fire didn't take hold and we put it out before it could destroy the bridge. After a short stay in Clarksville, we receive orders to sail on to Nashville, Tennessee and secure that city. Upon arrival in Nashville, we discover that the rebels have also departed that city. So far, we've only fired our guns for practice. After several weeks in Nashville, we are ordered to head back down the Cumberland River to Savannah, Tennessee. We arrive there March 31st. The next day, General Grant sets up his headquarters at the Cherry Mansion on the Tennessee River. We pass by the mansion as we depart, sailing down the Tennessee River with the gunboats Lexington and Tyler. We have joined Brigadier General William T. Sherman on an expedition against the Confederate batteries at Eastport, Mississippi. We arrive at Eastport and run our guns out, firing a few rounds, but there is no reply. The rebels have once again fled. We continue south to Chickasaw, Alabama, just north of Mobile. Arriving at Chickasaw, we find once more that the rebel troops have departed. Lieutenant Bryant believes they have gone to Mobile to help protect that city. There were no battles, but at least we were able to fire our guns for a reason other than practice. While at Chickasaw, we receive orders to move back upriver to the Cairo, Illinois Naval Base to defend it against a threatened Confederate attack. Flag Officer Foote has received word that the South has completed 13 gunboats at New Orleans, and he fears these will join the Ram Manassas and run up the Mississippi River against the Union fleet and bases. We arrive at the Cairo Naval Station on April the 5th. Later we hear news that on April 6th, a surprise Confederate attack on General Grant's troops near Savannah, Tennessee, where we had just left, resulted in a major battle at nearby Shiloh, Tennessee. We now have more reason to complain about our inability to take part in battle action. While we're at the Cairo Naval Station, Lieutenant Bryant has his pilot house strengthened because the Confederates at Fort Donaldson had scored damaging hits on the sister ironclad by centering their fire on the pilot houses, killing and wounding several men. Flag Officer Foote was struck on the ankle by a piece of iron during that battle. Today is Friday, April 11th, and we have just received orders to head down the Mississippi River to join a fleet of Union vessels that are anchored off New Madrid, Missouri. Word spreads among the crew that we are going to attack Fort Pillow, a stronghold guarding the approach to Memphis, Tennessee. We are ordered to wait behind to protect the unwieldy mortar boats. Meanwhile, Flag Officer Foote's ankle wound has become worse and he is forced to retire. On May the 9th, command of the Western Fleet is handed over to Captain Charles H. Davis. On May the 13th, I write, At 10 p.m., a rocket was sent up from the flagship, the signal for action. In 10 minutes, all hands had their hammocks lashed up and were at their quarters, ready for action, but the rebels did not come. We were kept at the guns all night. Weather warm, mosquitoes worse than the rebels. A Confederate fleet of rams steams up from Fort Pillow just as a mortar boat guarded by our sister ironclad Cincinnati is being moored to begin its daily bombardment of the fort. This move by the rebels catches the ironclads unprepared, some of them without sufficient steam to hold against the current of the river. Their engineers throw oil and anything else that is flammable into the fireboxes in an effort to raise steam. The General Bragg ram dashes at the Cincinnati 
which responds by firing her heavy guns and retreating towards a bar where the depth of water is not sufficient for the ram to follow. The drag continues boldly on under fire of nearly the whole fleet and strikes the Cincinnati a violent blow that stops her flight. A few moments later, the General Sterling Price ram runs into the Cincinnati carrying away her rudder, stern post, and a large piece of her stern. This throws the Cincinnati stern to the Sumter ram who strikes her running at its fastest speed. The General Earl Van Doren ram follows behind the Price and Sumter rams. It runs toward the Mound City ironclad which is pouring broadsides into them. The Van Dorn silences a mortar boat and then strikes our Mound City ironclad with a glancing blow, making a hole four feet long in her side. across the river and have our first chance for battle action. As our guns are rapidly fired, a ball from the Van Dorn strikes near our center port but glances off without doing any damage. Then we turn our attention to the damaged Mound City. We accompany her until she grounds herself. As our cannons are inferior to the Confederates, we are forced to fall back to shallow water. The Cincinnati ironclad sinks near the shore and the Mound City ironclad sinks on a sandbar. These two ironclads will later be raised and repaired under the guidance of James Eads. Three more Confederate rams enter the fight, but they realize that our boats have taken positions where the water is too shallow for them to go, so they depart and steam south to the protection of the heavy guns of Fort Bellow. As the Confederate boats flee downstream, we follow them to within range of the guns of Fort Bellow, and then tie up a short distance upriver. Our mortar boats hurl 200-pound shells in a bombardment that will last for seven weeks. Day after day, sometimes at the rate of one a minute, shells are dropped upon the fort. The Confederates fire back occasionally, scoring hits, but never inflicting serious damage. A joint attack on Fort Pillow with troops moving in from the land side is planned for June the 5th, but the rebels evacuate the fort and burn it down on June the 4th. By noon of the next day, the Confederate fleet has moved to Memphis. At last we have something to talk about. We have taken part in what is described as the first fleet action of the war. We now advance on Memphis, arriving there the evening of June the 5th. At dawn, the Confederate fleet, consisting of eight rams and gunboats, are facing such a shortage of coal that it is unthinkable to go further downstream. They form a line in front of the city to await battle. We start the battle at 5.30 a.m. by firing our 42-pounder dial rifle. Throughout the action, we keep busy firing, rescuing men from the water, and finally taking part in the running battle. Five of the Rebel gunboats are sunk or run ashore. Two more are seriously damaged and only one, the Van Dorn, manages to escape. By 7 a.m. the battle is over and we have won. We stay at Memphis for six days before heading back upriver to Fort Pillow where we stay three months on patrol duty. On September the 9th I write, at 8 a.m. we weighed anchor and started down the river. We arrived at Memphis at 8 p.m dropped anchor astern of the gunboat St. Louis and went ashore at 8.30 p.m. to buy grub but resumed about 12 midnight without finding any, the stores being all closed. On September the 12th, I write, at 1 p.m. we received on board Commander Selfridge as our captain, Captain Bryant being in ill health. He was sent home to recruit his health. Commander Selfridge, although a hard worker, has a record of misfortune. Two of his previous vessels were sunk while under his command. Our first assignment after he assumes command is to guard transports taking rebel prisoners down the river for exchange at Vicksburg, Mississippi and to return with the repatriated Union soldiers. 
On the way back, Commander Selfridge gets into an argument with Chief Pilot Oscar B. Jolly, one of the best on the river, who promptly resigns. After the incident, we all begin forming our own opinions of the new captain. At 11 p.m., we dropped anchor about 50 miles from Helena, Arkansas. I had to stand watch from 8 p.m. to 12 midnight today for not getting my hammock early enough. While there, we received notice from Rear Admiral David Porter that an active campaign on the Mississippi is about to begin. It is to be another advance on Vicksburg, this time by land and by water. The Army under General Grant is already moving south from Tennessee. Our assignment will be to help clear out the Yazoo River of Rebels as far up as Greenwood, Mississippi. On December the 11th, a reconnaissance up the Yazoo is carried out by the Ten Clads, Memora, and Signal. Some 20 miles up the river, they spot several suspicious objects floating on the water. A seaman on the Memora fires a musket at one of them and it sets off a huge explosion. They realize that they have found some of the vaunted Confederate torpedoes. They return to the mouth of the river and say that the number of small scows and stationary floats they saw indicate the presence of other torpedoes. They believe they can safely lift them from the water and deactivate them if they are protected by one or two gunboats. Commander Selfridge requests permission to use us on such a venture, and Fleet Commander Henry Walk consents. He also designates the gunboat Pittsburgh and the Ram Queen of the West to go along with us. The officers are told to avoid the channel where the mines are set. We proceed up the Yazoo River with the other boats. Occasionally, sharpshooters fire from trees on shore, and a few shells are tossed at us without damage. Commander Selfridge becomes impatient with our slow progress. He shouts orders to the Queen of the West to go faster. Someone on the Memora shouts back, here is where the torpedoes are. The other officers realize that more speed imperils the safety of the boats. Commander Selfridge sees firing coming from the Memora, and it is aimed at a block of wood floating in the river. He gets impatient and seems to have little fear of the torpedoes. We take the lead and advance into unchecked waters. We were drifting dangerously close to the shore. Eight heavy guns atop Drumgool's bluff opened fire and were quickly answered by our three forward cannons. Commander Shelfridge yelled for the engines to be reversed. Then seeing he was about to strike another gunboat, ordered them to get out of the way. At 11.30 a.m., just as we were training on a battery, which is about two and a half miles further up the river, we were struck by a torpedo, which exploded under the forward part of our boat. We were then told to leave quarters and take all the small arms we could and go aboard the ram, which we did at double quick time, I can tell you. I saved two revolvers, and most all of us saved something. As we are pulled aboard the other boats, all we can see of our ironclad are the tops of our 28-foot smokestacks and some flagstaffs poking above the surface. One of our sailors later says that Commander Selfridge had doomed our vessel the minute he stepped aboard. Rear Admiral David D. Porter sends the following message to the Honorable Gideon Wells, Secretary of the Navy. Sir, I regret to inform you that the Cairo ironclad has been blown up by a torpedo in the Yazoo River. In the summer of 1956, 94 years after sinking, the Cairo's remains are found. The gunboat is recovered and is on display at the Vicksburg National Military Park in Vicksburg, Mississippi.